Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that introduces you to some of the top talent in the world of cybersecurity. Hello and welcome to No Password Required, a podcast dedicated to exploring the minds and personalities that make up the field of cybersecurity. I'm your host, Ernie Ferraresso, and with me as always is Jack Clabby, a cybersecurity attorney at Carlton Fields PA in Tampa, and Pablo Torres, a senior cloud security engineer at Second Watch. On the podcast today, we'll chat with Larry Whiteside Jr., the co-founder and president of Cyversity, a nonprofit whose mission is to achieve the consistent representation of women and underrepresented minorities in the cybersecurity industry. Larry is an Air Force veteran and has over 25 years of experience in the information security field. Larry, we look forward to a great conversation. But first, hello to my co-host, Jack and Pablo. Gentlemen, good day. Hey, Ernie. Hey, Pablo. Hey, guys. How, how is everyone? It's definitely been a while since we've gone together. No, it's good to connect. Uh, certainly a lot's happened in the world uh, since we last got together. So, you know, Indeed it has. Yeah, I mean, I think the, we have to say something about what the cybersecurity industry is talking about, which is the, uh, the conflict in Ukraine and you know, there's a lot of ways to look at this. And, you know, there was a lot of conversation early on about it, whether this is going to have cyber warfare as a big part of it. And, and there definitely has been those components. But I think folks maybe were surprised that at least up to date, it hasn't been as much cyber warfare, probably as, as anticipated, you know, based on the track record uh, of, of the Russians. So one of the things that, at least in the legal community, that was talked about a lot has been what role cyber insurance is going to play, because it's so integral mm. To so many companies, you know, if there's spillover from attacks um, by Russia against the Ukraine, uh, what the response would be. And there has been, you know, Russia is not the first time that Russia has used offensive cyber weapons. And, you know, NotPetya was was back in 2017 was something uh, that had a, had a long tail to it. So I think in, the, in those cases, there have been actual cases brought by insureds against insurers. And they came out sort of all over the place. Uh, and they turned on these, they call the war exclusion, which is you'll be covered for cyber incidents according to the policy, you know, except, you know, in a variety of circumstances, including uh, acts of war. And there were others called hostile act exclusions. And there had been some cases, including a really big one uh, brought by a, uh, a global pharmaceutical company where the insured had success saying that, you know, not pet yet was not technically an act of war. It was something else or the language didn't say what I think the carrier had intended it to be. So there's a lot of um, that can be said about those things. But even at the outset of the Ukraine conflict, underwriters came up with sort of new exclusions that were broader um, to try to make sure that the courts would see it their way. Um, So it's an odd, I mean, we're seeing this conflict in real time, which has this, you know, awful human, awful human toll. And, you know, the uh, this has to be one of the first conflicts where there's been sort of an insurance response immediately. Maybe I'm way off on that, but but it, there was a lot of conversation in it. And, and it, frankly, it gives us something to talk about that isn't the terrifying thing uh, in a way. Yeah. Right? It gives, well, you know, I, we're I, all scared of it. it we're, no one wants to talk about what's how horrible it is. And so we, we, we kind of do these other things to almost give ourselves something to distract ourselves about it, Ernie. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting. <laughs> you mentioned how uh, this may be the, the first... Uh, war where insurance was uh, was played in, and that'd be an interesting to look back and, and see. You know, okay, um, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, did you know what did the Honolulu insurance market look like after that? Um, but I, I think that also brings in something that makes this a uh, what's a brave new world, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because in any of these previous wars, uh, the United States were surrounded by a a pretty big moat on both sides, known as the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and so you didn't really have to worry about things like that. I mean, maybe you could, the U-boat war and all that, whatever. But uh, um, but yeah, it's, but now it now it's it's real easy. It, we've seen it, right? That somebody does something over in, in Moscow or or on the U- Ukrainian border, and it, it, it does have the ability to, to spill over. So, Jack, I'm, that's something I'd be wondering about. What is, I mean, you're the... Uh, you're, this is this is like your field, man. Yeah. What's going to happen? We need you to pick up the magic insurance eight ball and tell us, <laughs> no. you know, what should we do? Well, I tell you, you know, insurance. The big game of insurance got started uh, 
for ways for folks to spread the risk 300 years ago when uh, they were pooling their money together to send ships from, Euro- from Europe to do awful things in, 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 nor- in North America, right? So it, it <laughs> yeah. has this, you know, and then if you were attacked by a pirate, it, was it a pirate or did they have a letter of mark from, from a foreign government that allowed it to become an act of, you know, an act of war <laughs> versus a crime? So, I mean, these are, these are, they're not new issues, Ernie. Right. There are issues yeah. that go back to the original pooling of risk, uh, you know, in, in the London exchanges. And so there is there is law here. And I think what it comes down to is what's the intent of the parties when they sign these insurance agreements. Yeah. Right. And it, it shouldn't require looking at what the parliament did in uh, in Russia and whether Russia declared war. The idea is, right, the cyber insurance is going to cover a certain group of things and not at all that. So I don't want to say too much about it as I may be litigating these issues and I don't want to take a position one way or the other. But it is funny, you know, it's funny because it shows the limits of the law, which is all the law. What we really want to talk about is how scary it is what's happening and how bad it is to the people of the Ukraine and how bad the Russians are. Right. I mean, that's what we want to say. And instead, we, we give ourselves intellectual puzzles to solve, so we feel like we're doing something. We, we, Pablo, yeah, exactly. Pablo, what's happening? You know, on, on, in your world, what are you seeing? You know. Um, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah, that is uh, definitely a lot of risk to mitigate, especially in your field, Jack. And uh, Ernie brought up a great point with the the moat, the the great moats that we have around our country, and what it is that that's protected us for all these years. Um, maybe not so much now. I'm not saying that we have a critical infrastructure, but what I'm saying is that now we can see cyber warfare transcending borders. And um, something that I picked up on my radar has been the 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 the, the rise of hacktivism. Um, again, uh, with the Ukraine war and 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 how it's uh, sparked a revival. And uh, something that I that I picked up on uh, here, sharing with the team, on February 26th, uh, Ukraine's Vice Prime Minister uh, Mikhailo Fedorov. Uh, announced lo- the launch of an IT army, um, urging underground hackers to globally start disruptive cyber attacks on Moscow and to bolster the cyber defenses of uh, Ukraine's critical infrastructure. Uh, within just a few days, it's grown to more than 400,000 members. Um, the level of communication of, of just the hacktivism and, and the individuals who are participating in this initiative is great um, because we're, we're helping defend a, a very defenseless country against a, a very strong superpower. Um, what do you guys think? I mean, do you think it's, it's appropriate for so many individuals to, to join as a collective to, to help battle Moscow? I, I think whether we think it's appropriate or not, they're going to do it. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, one of the things. And I, I'm going to throw this out as, a, as another flyer on, the, on this thing that uh, may or may not be considered. Uh, so I'm Moscow. Do I care that it, it's either a uniformed Ukrainian member uh, slinging electrons at me from someplace in Ukraine, or it's somebody from, I don't know, Sacramento, California, sitting in their hoodie uh, slinging electrons? And but the it, the effect is the same. Do I care? Maybe I just say, hey, somebody's attacking me. Does this allow for uh, unintended escalation? Or what is it uh, on, on Moscow's part? So just another, another you know, interesting thread uh, yeah. to pull on that. Yeah, to be yeah. There's an army that a nation state controls, and then there's everybody else. And you know, it's not like you're. This isn't like access to weapons. This is everyone. The weapon that this would unleash, this kind of call to arms, is control. It's not centralized, so anyone can use it. I, yep. To me, the the story that I've heard told about why, at least to date. There has not been a lot of spillover and why whatever Russia might be doing hasn't been effective. I had a couple pieces and Pablo, the hacktivism is one of them, which is, you know, the, the, the sort of what you might call the allegedly criminal underbelly of the cyber world isn't all aligned with Russia. It certainly isn't. And so I think that might have an element to it. And then the second is the Ukrainian defenses were stronger than I think mm-hmm. a lot a lot of people um, said they would be. And they were getting support you know, as it's been publicly reported from other countries in the West for, for years now. Um, and then the third is, I think the story that I think is pretty cool, too, is that a lot of larger U.S.-based uh, computer software and cybersecurity companies, again, acting with the, with the wink and the nod, if not the overt um, support of, of, Russia, of, of Ukraine, are helping, right? And yeah. so if, if Russia's yep. going to use zero-day exploits on well-known products, those products if they're supported by companies based in the U.S. or based in England, ain't going to let it happen, right? Yep. So they're going to shut that thing down pretty quickly. So you're really seeing, 
you know, probably, you know, like think about World War II, right? The, the, the planes mm-hmm. were built by private contractors. And so I think that's the third prong of, of why Ukraine has been able to hold uh, on the cyber side of it has been, at least it's the way it's been publicly reported, is big U.S. companies have been turning their considerable resources to plugging up those defenses. I think, you know, it, it's that question of are you a pirate or are you a privateer? Right. And so maybe maybe these are privateers with, with what the Ukraine has been saying about it. Well, I think, too. Well, yeah. I was going to say, Jack, you're funny you mentioned that, because uh, I want to say that uh, on the Russian side, they just passed some law, I believe, dealing with intellectual property that if it was, uh, you know, like it was something that was left when the company uh, stopped doing business in yeah. Russia, that they can come in and oh, take man. that. Uh, and they, there was some cyber aspect to that. So it's almost, yeah. you can imagine, oh, really? So I can, Russia's not going to prosecute me when I go, you know, break it into the source code and steal all that? Uh, you know, congratulations. That, how, oh, and, the, and the, they're going to help support my, now you're into that cyber privateer because you get to keep the spoils of. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's, it is, it is, we're, as much as this has been planned for and prepared for, we are, we are in a new country here, and this yes. is really something different. And I think you know, think about the seizing of the of the airplanes that Russia did. Yes, so yeah. I, I, you know, at, at the heart of the whole thing, and we have fun with it, but at the heart of the whole thing is an extraordinary tragedy. What is unfolding in uh, Ukraine is is a, a truly uh, unprecedented human tragedy um, that yeah. that we need to take seriously. And it's it uh, it's the, any, any war is bad. Um, and this one is particularly uh, bad for the folks there in Europe. Yeah. Well, we're still going to have some fun today, uh, I think, when we talk about stuff, Ernie, and when we talk to Larry. So we'll still have we'll I think so. I think so. Yeah, we'll bring it back up again. So that said, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, we're going to talk to Larry about his life in the cybersecurity world and how his early career was a series of level ups. So stick around. Looking for more no password required content? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at NoPasswordPod. Welcome back. Our guest is Larry Whiteside, a CISO and mentor whose goal in life is to bring value to those he interacts with. Larry, welcome to No Password Required, sir. Hey, how's everybody doing? Every day is better than the last. That's right. So, Larry... uh, We'd love to hear about how you, a little bit about your career path and how it led to your current role as the president of Cybersity. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a bit of a jagged edge, right, of how I got here because it's not a straight line. And what I tell everybody, right, you know, I get the question all the time, how do I become you? How do I become a CISO? I'm like, there's no correct answer to that um, because for every person it's going to be different. And so for me, I will say the catalyst started with my parents getting divorced and me ending up going from a, a school in an underserved community, going to a predominantly uh, a white high school where I saw my first computer as a junior in high school, uh, to me, you know, joining the Air Force um, and getting, uh, uh, becoming an officer in the Air Force at the behest of my grandfather, who was a pilot and told me, hey, that technology thing is going to die, right? <laughs> Him being a techno- him being a Tuskegee Airman, he said they're always going to need pilots, so go be a pilot, right? And so, even though I had no intention of ever joining the Air Force in my entire life, getting out of college with a computer science degree, not really being able to find a job that I liked, having an internship doing uh, writing code that I hated, um, I said, well, let me see. And I went and talked to an Air Force recruiter, and they had uh, what they call an AFSC, which is an Air Force specialty code of jobs in this technology arena. So I was like, okay, well, why not? So let's try it. Um, and then when I when I got into the service, cyber was, or I should say information security and what we called then network security was becoming a thing. And so I got my first job as the chief of what was a new role called the base network control center. And so it just sort of from there just grew, right? Uh, 94 to 98, right? I'm at Pope Air Force Base. Um, we've, I'm, I'm running the network control center and, you know, putting firewalls in place because that was the thing, right? Build this strong perimeter, right? Uh, running vulnerability assessments internally and, and doing that type of stuff. And then 
Um, I applied for a role of what I thought was a security analyst at the Pentagon, which ended up being the chief of information warfare. <laughs> <So> <laughs> very different from what I thought it was going to be. That was poor labeling. That, that was poor me. labeling on the job. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, it was really interesting. And I'll never forget Major Paul Bielefeld. And I'm, I walk into his office and it's this, you know, going to the Pentagon as a captain, Right. Like you are literally on the lowest portion of the totem pole as an officer. And but I walk into this mahogany office right, and I'm like, oh, this is you know, this is really nice. He's like, yeah, just put your back down. And we run off to a briefing. Um, and so <laughs> it was it was just interesting to be now in the scenario where I, I was given post-it notes and I was given, you know, coffee filters because everybody figured you're going to the Pentagon as a captain. You're going to be getting coffee for people. <laughs> but I end up in a role running this, you know, decently large organization doing something that, you know, was brand new and was just started to come to fruition uh, from an industry standpoint. So, um, uh, but then I realized I was not a career guy. Um, I was not built to do a life in the Air Force. And so I separated uh, after right about eight years um, and got out and went in the private sector. And, you know, private sector became a whole nother avenue because I had not really done private sector to that point, but I went and I work for a company called True Secure. So those who've been in the industry for a while probably remember True Secure prior to the Verizon acquisition um, because they were True Secure, then became CyberTrust, and then became Verizon's yeah. security business. Um, and I went and worked for them for, for a year, and then I went from there to be a, a CISO of a nuclear naval agency. And it's just been chance and happenstance and God, honestly, right, from my perspective. Wait, that, that Larry, can we step back? Did you just say you were the CISO for, for a nuclear agency? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, nuclear naval agency. It was interesting. I was going to say, what, what's the nuclear naval uh, agency? Yeah, so, so what it was is um, there are a number of different entities, right, within the federal government and within the Department of Defense that run different parts of what we do from a defense standpoint. And one of them is a nuclear naval agency run out of D.C., where right, if we think about subs, right, they have a ton of technology on them, yeah. right? And, the, and, and in order to, the, but the, with all of the technology that is put inside of these, you've got to think cyber is a thing. And at the time it wasn't cyber, it was still information security, right? This is 2002. Cyber Command hadn't even been formed yet, right? Homeland Security was only, you know, just beginning to be formed itself, right? And so... So at this point in time, they're still like, listen, information security, we're worried about the security of this environment. And because this agency was largely filled with contractors, so if you think about the big three external contractors, yeah, they sort of ran and governed all the technological components. So I had people in the UK, I had people here across the US that had responsibilities around the architecture and building of these um, these ships and the comp uh, wow. these um, subs and the components that went in them. So. It's a, it was a very, very interesting role. And that's actually, funny as it is, was where I learned about SIM, the Security Information Management, Security and Event Information Management Tool. It was the first time I had ever heard of it, had ever, had ever really, really dealt with it at, 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 a, at a corporate level. And so when I went to, uh, when I was using it there, I heard about ArcSight and went and, you know, ended up buying ArcSight and everybody remembers ArcSight. Um, but that... That ended up, as funny as it is, being my, my wife at the time, um, she said, hey, hon, that we had just had our third child. So we had twins that were three and a newborn. And she said, the kids and I are moving to New York. Are you coming? <laughs> so as a, as a good soldier, I saluted and said, yes, ma'am, and, and, and moved to New York because I had separated. And so from her perspective, you are no longer in the military. We don't need to be in D.C. Yeah. Um, so, so going from, from that nuclear naval agency, now I had to find a job. Well, I ended up finding a job in the technology space in cyber, right, for a SIM company that was a competitor to ArcSight, mm. right? And, and again, I'd never known about the SIM space, but purchasing ArcSight gave me a lot of insight into it. And because at that time, you know, being the head of security, you were still really technical, right? I was still doing command line things, right? It's way different than where it is today. So I still had command line access and admin access and was configuring databases and doing all that type of stuff. So 
when I chose to leave there to be, you know, at the time, a, a good husband and father. And I ended up going to this other organization called, um, well, and, and I'll, I'll leave the name out to, to save the innocent, right? But <laughs> um, this is a family uh, show. Gave, you know. <laughs> right. Well, but, but the, I say this for this reason. So one of the things that I have probably learned more than anything as it relates to this overall industry. So if you think about the hundreds, if not thousands of cyber companies that are coming out and developing yeah. tools and developing capabilities on a regular basis, we as an industry struggle with this best of breed tool, right? This tool has got to be great. The tool has to do every single thing that I could possibly ever imagine versus, um, well, what's ease of management? Right. Ah, uh, well, I need to be able to manage it. I need to be able to support. I need to be able. Is the company going to exist in five years? That type of thing, right? And so, going to this company, uh, in the sim space after having been a practitioner, it gave me some perspective as I watched the company fail. Mm. Right. Where 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 they had at the time, Arcside had ten to twenty customers globally. This company had well over three hundred. But I watched over the year that I was with them, ArcSight continuously just go up, 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 yeah. and this company just go down, 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 to the point that I walked this company into the Pentagon for for them to purchase the sim from us, and then ArcSight replaced us a year later. Yeah. Wow. Right. But what it gave me perspective on was this: is you, you can have the best tool on the planet. If you don't have, if, if the company does not have a good vision and the company does not have good leaders, it's going to fail, hmm. period, point blank. If they, and, and, and as, a, as a practitioner, when you are looking to acquire a tool, one of the most important things is not what they do today, but based on their vision, what are they going to be doing tomorrow? And mm. you need to make sure that what they're doing tomorrow is going to align to what you need to be able to do tomorrow. <laughs> because if they are working for the point solution that you're trying to buy them for now, but then tomorrow y'all go in completely different directions, the tool is not going to serve purpose and it's going to, going to uh, contribute to what we deal with today as shelfware. Number two is, is if you have leadership in a company that you begin to work with that over promises and under delivers, the tool is going to fail. Huh. And yeah. then again, you're going to have shelfware again. You're going to be dealing with, you know, your, your corporate leaders asking you, well, I just gave you $500,000. I just gave you a million dollars to buy this tool a year ago. Why are you trying to replace it? Why are you trying to go back? And if you remember back then, most of the stuff was CapEx. So once you spend the CapEx, that money is gone. It's right? gone. It's yeah. Not, it, right. It's not like you can come back and say, well, I'm cutting off, you know, today with it being OPEX. If you spent a million dollars in OPEX last year, now you want to replace it. Well, technically, that OPEX is just going to be applied towards something else because it's right. It's not something that you're drawing down on. And so um, it, 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 it was just a big, big lesson for me that I've been able to carry forward as I move forward. And I think has added a lot of value um, for me being a CISO as I've continued my career. Can you tell us a little bit more about about Cyversity and uh, and, and its yeah. and its mission? Yeah, so so let, let me give you the origins. You know, in 2014, there were a number of us, uh, about five of us to be exact, that came together and like, you know, we've all been CISOs, right? S senior executives, and we're speaking at RSA and all of the different conferences and attending all the different conferences and participating in networking sessions. We're like, we're not seeing enough of us. We don't see enough people to look like us. We're not seeing enough women. We're not like, w what is going on in this industry? And so we came together that, at that time to say, like, let's try and be difference makers, right? Let's try and do something. And so when we created the organization, and, and it, it still stands today, our mission is to increase uh, the number of, of diverse BIPOC women, LGBTQ plus people that are in the industry both from a creating a pipeline to get them in, but also elevating those who are in to mm. hopefully then get enough executives that will mirror what the world looks like, right? Today, today we do not have nearly enough diverse CISOs in the ranks. We just don't. 
and and we could take that even further right as you go further down the chain yeah as you go further down the chain the the number of diverse uh, practitioners does start to, has started to grow but what's happening is black women are leaving the industry f- faster than anyone else because companies are not prepared on how to keep them right so if you yeah. think about this Okay, great. We get people into the industry. We're starting to try and create pipelines at the beginning, right? And trying to get collegiates and trying to get non-collegiates. And and, and I stress that piece because yeah. if we just focus on collegiates, we're xing out a large uh, um, demographic because you know college costs money. So when you look at the peer percentages, it, it's a far lower percentage of of BIPOC and people coming from underserved communities that are going to college because they don't have the funds, they don't have the resources to do it. So, so, but when you, once you get them in, the challenge is keeping them because you have to create safe spaces. You have to make them feel, um, they have, you have to make them feel that they understand how does what they do on a daily basis tie to the overall mission of the organization so that they come in and they continue to feel inspired. They continue, continue to feel like they're part of the solution of what's being offered at the company. And a lot of times we just don't do that. We don't yeah. do that well. You mentioned that. That's interesting. If, if you're in a, in, a, in a company, in a leadership role, what is it that you know you could do tomorrow or, or today for that today. matter to, to set that, those things up? I mean, what, you know, practical things to do that because I, I, I see a lot of uh, organizations and companies that I'll, I'll say that they, uh, they talk to talk for varying reasons. They just have a hard time walking the walk. So how do they, how do they close that up? Yeah, so, so let me start with the – Yeah. People have to get past this being a numbers game. Number yeah. one, they have to get past the, the the okay. I hired two people of color. I hired three women. Good, right? No, right? Because because the what what you have to do moving forward is you have to then allow them to have a voice. Just because they're in the org doesn't mean that you've given them a voice to express their opinions, to express their their views, to express their lens. And I call it a lens because the, the reality is this. So diversity is more than gender. It's more than race and creed and color and, and all of it. It's background. It's this whole it's aspect of a whole person. And what happens is if people don't have a voice, the diverse component of them is not being allowed to show its true value. Mm. Right. So if you hire 10 people and you hire, uh, you know, two two uh, people who are diverse racially and then you hire three people who are diverse genderly and then then uh, and now you've got this mix of 10 people. Great. But if the majority people that are the are alike are leading all the conversations, the majority of people who are alike are canceling out input from the others because those five tend to agree, have a, have a similar background, have a sim, have uh, come from similar makeups, right? And they all have similar views. If they are overshadowing the voice of the other five and their individuality, then you're not getting what you need out of that. And so it's giving voice and giving credence to those voices that come with a different lens, right? So I just gave a talk the other day in Orlando um, at an advisory board meeting. And one of the things I showed uh, was a picture. And this picture was the same corner from three different angles, right? And when you looked at this one picture that had three different angles of the same corner, each one showed a very different perspective of what that corner looked like. Mm. In one corner, right, it was clean, right? There, were, there was, the, the, there was a, a park with grass and birds and another, uh, another angle showed a bum next to a trash can that was overflowing. Hmm. And another angle showed a, piece of a, uh, showed a piece of a truck that was being unloaded at a super busy street. Now, when you looked at that picture, even though it was the exact same corner, when you're coming at it from those three different angles, each lens gives you a completely different perspective hmm. of what that park is, what that means, right? One, one is, you know, potentially, you know, not to be, not to be crude, but you know, dirty. If there's a a bum or a derelict there, and there's trash overflowing. Ew, right? Then another is a super busy street. Oh, that must be a, a middle of downtown somewhere because there's a moving truck with busy cars pulling by. And then another one shows a park, hmm. right? And it's all literally the same corner. We're talking about a 50 feet radius, but 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 looking through it from each of those different lenses. Right. And that's how pe- that's how people view the world. That's how mm-hmm. pe- everybody's background shapes them differently. Mm-hmm. So what people can do is give 
those diverse voices, those diverse entities in their organization, once you have them, a voice and give them feedback, right? They, because they need to see and feel that they are heard and understand that, that what they're saying has been heard by someone and has been taken into account. Not that you must always placate to them and make them feel as if, oh, your ideas are great. Oh, we're going to use that. No, it's not that. But it's making them feel heard. Larry, there's been some articles like in the New York Times and, and mainstream press about the pandemic and work from home. And the kind of like the yeah. argument they've made has been this has actually been good um, in some ways for, for women and underrepresented minorities because they're, you know, if everyone's working from home, it's the work that gets evaluated and not the other kind of like politics sometimes. And we've seen it, I mean, in the cybersecurity, you know, incident management response world where you've got a SOC that was, you know, essentially a bullpen and now the SOC is virtual and everybody's working at home. Have you seen anything, you know, what do you think about that sort of argument that this has been a good thing, the work from home environment? Yes. Yeah, so so there's, a, there's a couple of points to it. So yes, I agree that, that the pandemic ha- pushing people home has actually helped in some instances because to your point, work now is measured more than the internal, you know, uh, water cooler boys and girls club, right? So, so now it's, not, it's less about who you've got a relationship with and who is delivering. But the other piece that, that is not being talked about as broadly as it should be is now geography doesn't matter. Right. So so one of the challenges that has existed, if you think where corporate America builds their offices, they build them in major cities. Why do they build them in major cities? They build them in major cities because that's where they feel there's going to be talent and people that they can get into a physical location. Right. So they can hire in that major city. Well, what happens is you're missing out Uh, when it comes to demographics, underserved communities. There are some that exist in major cities, but there are large ones that exist outside of major cities because they can't afford to live in those major yeah. cities. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? And so if you're building offices in major cities, you're missing and you're forcing people to go into offices, you're missing out on a large opportunity to find diverse talent that doesn't sit in those major cities because they can't economically afford to. That's a good point. So what the pandemic has done has allowed geography to be removed from the equation of where we're hiring. And so when, when, as companies have started looking more holistically from a geography standpoint, they've been able to find some great diverse talent in towns and in cities that, that they don't have offices and they otherwise would not have recruited somebody from. This person would have been immediately scratched from the list, right? Because they don't, the, their resume doesn't say they're in a town where they have, there's an office. Changing gears a little bit, um... You know, we talked a little bit about your time in the Air Force. And what was it like for uh, for young Larry Whiteside growing up? Uh, you know, you mentioned your you mentioned your grandfather is uh, one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. I mean, yeah. what was it like for uh, for for young Larry Whiteside? So, so it's interesting. So, I I, I came up rough. I, I have a very very interesting and rough background. So, so my dad, uh, God love him. Um, and, and rest his soul. He was into drugs. He got into drugs very heavily um, when I was when I was young. And so he was a, I call him a jack of all trades, right? He he was a mechanic and he was an electrician and he just basically did a little bit of everything. But there was only a short period in my lifetime where he actually held an actual job, and we were quote unquote middle class, right? So you know we moved out of an apartment into uh, into a house. It was the first house I'd ever actually lived in. Um, and I was, what, five years old when we bought that house. And, you know, so for probably about four years, he had an actual job. And my, my, my sister was born when I was five. And so we had this, quote, unquote, middle class life for a very short period of time. But as he got heavier into drugs and the job dissipated, um, things got really rough. And thank God for my mom. My mom was a rock. My mom was, was the one who always gave my sister and I the affirmation that we could do anything or be anything. But, you know, I was, I was a troubled kid. I was, I was flunking out of seventh grade. Had, had my grandmother not died and my mother made the decision because she wanted to try and get my dad out of the drug situation that he was in. Had she not made a decision for us to move to San Antonio, I wouldn't be here today, Mm. right? Because we were in Houston and I was flunking out of seventh grade. I wasn't doing any homework. I wasn't in the sports. I wasn't, I was just, I was just a bad dysfunctional kid. And it was largely because of my home situation, 
my mom and dad were were in a bad situation. My dad was just doing drugs and drinking, and that's pretty much all he did. I found out that he was a drug dealer as well. And, you know, I recall being high in the car off of contact smoke with him, getting high and that type of stuff, right? And so, um, you know, I also saw my dad, you know, being a philanderer and, you know, Papa was a rolling stone, stone type thing. Yeah. Um, so, so because of that, you know, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, I just was out there and I was out there bad. But my mom made the decision, and it's interesting, you know, I look back and I tell my mom all the time that she was an, a catalyst for me. And I, and I know ultimately it was God that, that sort of made these things happen, but it was her making decisions to move us in one direction or another that changed my the parallel of my life. It literally changed, like, what was going to happen and basically made me avert in another direction, right? Because it, the first time it was us moving to San Antonio, so... <laughs> it was funny because I ended up at a school in San Antonio on the east side and two things happened. One was the school from a curriculum standpoint was behind where I was in Houston. Okay. And so even though I was flunking in Houston, when I got there and I already knew all the stuff because I had already studied it six months earlier, it was just easy. So I was like, oh. So then as I started doing the work and I realized girls liked that I was smart and knew all the work. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. smart is cool. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> that's that's a thing, right? Uh, but the other thing that happened was, so my mother's first cousins, who were probably about 10 years younger than her, and, and so to be under, to be clear, my mom had me at 17. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were not much old, and they were probably 10 years older than me and seven years younger than my mom. Mm -hmm. Well, the middle school that I ended up going to the end of my seventh grade year and eighth grade year, they went to. And the basketball coach who was there, who was also the assistant football coach, had coached them. Hmm. So they basically told him, hey, Coach McNeil, that's our little cousin Larry. Make him play basketball. Now, at the time, as I said, I wasn't really big in the sports. I was playing Pop Warner football, and then I played middle school football. So here I get to the eighth grade and they basically forced me to play basketball and I had no interest in basketball. I had never played basketball. I wasn't right. It wasn't a thing. I had cousins in California who had sort of shown me basketball, but I hadn't gotten to the point of being in love with it. But once I got forced to be on this team, I fell in love, right? And basketball mm. became my thing. So this moving to San Antonio really, really helped me a realize being smart was okay. Right. Um, and B helped me find the, the sport that ended up, changing you know my life uh, holistically um and and you know i look back at my mom and i say listen you uh god just sort of placed the hand on you placed his hand on you and helped you make a decision that was you know for the betterment of 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 you and in your eyes at the time but it ultimately ended up being for the betterment of me for the long range uh, aspect of my life how do you approach through diversity now how do you approach now mentoring i mean do you think about experiences oh, you had with coaches and, and try to translate it like how does it work huge yeah so so for us mentoring is a fundamental part of our organization so and and we believe that that everybody should a have a mentor but also be a mentor okay. a lot of times people think well i don't have the experience like i can't mentor i've got i, I haven't done anything you know i'm i'm only three years into the field how can i mentor listen the reality is there is something that everyone brings to the table that someone else can glean from, period, point blank and period. And then even though, right, I'm 29 years in this space, right, I've still got a ton that I can learn, yeah. but I think it's, it's so important. So I have mentors. I've got mentors. I've got mentors who are in the industry. I have mentors who are not in the industry because the reality is mentorship isn't just about what you do as your day job. Mentorship is about life and bringing aspects of life to sort of formulate your whole person. And everybody's got some aspect of experience and life experience that they've gone through, whether it be career focused, whether it be life focused. And so I think everybody has an opportunity to A, learn from others around them, right? And so that the situation that others have gone through, they can, as if they come across it, because of this, they can go to someone that they can lean on and trust and say, hey, and they can sort of help guide you, but then also share your experiences. And I'll give a, a, a great example. So, so two actually. So we've got in in Cyversity, we've got some uh, 
young men who started with cybersecurity when they were in college, like they were collegiates and they were <laughs> one of them and a group of his friends actually drove from Rhode Island to DC uh, during their spring break for our conference, oh, wow. right? Slept in the car, the whole thing got like, it was, it was insane what they did, right? But this kid now, this kid now is, you know, making over six figures, mm -hmm. looking at starting his own technology company. Nice. Like he's doing, right? He's, he's a great example That's of great. what, and he, he, but he's been in our mentoring program for five years, right? But they didn't, for, you know, I've only been in this five years. They didn't think that they had anything to offer to us. And I'm like, listen, do you know how many middle school kids, yeah. how many high school kids, mm -hmm. how many, you know, college kids need to see you and understand that that they too? Because th the reality is, is what you see is what you believe, right? Yeah. So if you see people that look like you doing something, you hear that they have a similar story, even if it's not exactly the same. You hear their story of strife, struggle, and everything else. You know, well, wait, this is possible. Yeah. This is something that I can achieve despite my surroundings. This is something that I can do despite what's going on. This is something that I can accomplish, right? Um, the other example is, um, and I think it's important for when it comes to mentoring, some of it just happens organically, and it comes through sharing. Right. I've shared a number of my different life experiences, right, right, from the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I've actually had people come to me, right, asking me to mentor them in things outside of the career yeah. because I've openly shared about things that, that, that I've experienced, right? And so I think it's important that, that we as just people share and be comfortable sharing Right. And, and uh, you know, if somebody's going to try and use something against you negatively, that's going to happen whether you share it or not. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Day, that's right? It, 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 yep. it's, it's just going to happen. If someone's got ill intent for you, they're going to use the good, bad, and ugly to against you, regardless of whether you put it out there publicly or not. Right. Because they're going to be hunting and searching for it. But I think that there's more positive energy and there's more positive that comes back to you by you openly sharing it and letting others see that no matter who you are, life isn't perfect. And I use this last example, Will Smith. I don't know if you've read the book, Will, and I have, I do not get any money for this, but I will <laughs> tell you <laughs> that book is, a, is, is one of the perfect examples of, from an image standpoint, somebody who we think has everything. He's got all the money he could possibly ever have. He's making $20 million a movie. He's got a syndicated show that's been running for 20 years at this point. He got, he got everything. But he shares in his book his own personal struggles as a husband, his own personal struggles as a father, mm -hmm. and the things that he's gone through, where, where we, from an outside perspective, would look at him and say, whoo, yeah. I want to be that. Yeah. yeah. But I now, think... reading the book, you're like, oh my, wait, what? Wait, he's going through some of the same stuff that I've gone. Wait, what? He had a childhood like what? Right? And so it's just, it's. I tell people this all the time. Nobody's on an island. Even though we've all got a different lens, nobody's experiencing something that someone else isn't going through. So I, I, I ask people to openly share because it gives a better uh, perspective to others who may not be listening right now, but may hear it, you know, somewhere down the line. That's a great point about just about the difference between a life mentor and a professional mentor. And I think sometimes you, you, you might hear from people in the industry who are being professionally mentored well, but then they're going and doing things in their personal life that's going to put it in a hard position or vice versa. They've got very supportive mentors, but what they need is a sponsor at work. Right. They might need somebody to right. push them a little bit at work mm -hmm. who's not I'm not getting, yep. I'm not looking at the family stuff. Let's just talk about get you in the door and get you opportunities. And that's a good that's a great distinction, Larry. I think that's a very powerful one. You've talked about before, I think, the distinction between like when you're listening to somebody in a one on one scenario, listening to respond and then seeking to understand. Can you talk a little yep. bit about that and what the difference is between those two? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's huge, and that's huge for me both professionally, but even more so personally, right? So, I've got five kids. Um, you know, I'm I'm in a I'm in a relationship with the the most wonderful woman on the planet, and the reality is this: um, listening to respond means you have formulated a response. You're listening for a keyword, and then when a keyword pops, you 
literally formulate a response and you are it's on the tip of your tongue and you be what what tends to happen is you begin to interrupt them because you need to get this point across before you forget it because you have formulated a response versus sitting and listening there to everything that they're saying and then asking deeper questions to ensure that you understand the message that they're trying to get across to you. Seeking to understand does a couple of things. For one, it shows the other person that you are engaged, right? And that you care. Number two, it gives you a better ability to respond appropriately to what they're saying, right? Seeking to understand, do you ultimately respond? Absolutely. It's not saying that you don't respond. But how do you respond to something that you don't understand, right? It's like if you go to a foreign country and they're speaking, they're speaking Mandarin to you, and you respond, but you don't understand what they're saying. You have no clue what they're saying, right? But that's what happens when you listen to respond. When you see, when you just listen to respond, you have no idea what they're actually saying because you've already formulated a response based on this key word triggering you. And I'll tell you, applying it in your life, both professionally and personally. I don't care who you are. If you seek to understand first in all your conversations, it will change your life, period, point blank. And I, I use this and I say this, right? And God gave you two ears and a mouth. One mouth, just one. Two ears, one mouth, right? That's not so that directionally you've got a, a better ability. No, it's because if you think about it in practical sense, you should listen more than you speak. I got to tell you something, Larry. That's that's a, you, you you're you're putting out some that's some good good grandfatherly wisdom there. So when those five <laughs> kids grow up, you're already you're already you're already ahead of the game on that one. Uh, yeah. we I t- love that. We talk about the fifty percent rule at our house, which is if you're in a conversation and you're talking more than fifty percent of the time, give yourself to say I'm losing. You want the other person talking more than fifty percent of the time, right. and particularly when it's your mom you're talking to. That's what we say. That's what we say. <laughs> yes. and, and you should listen to Jack because he's an attorney and he knows about, yeah, you want to get the other no, person but, to talk because then, then you just capture it. You can just capture but it. But it's true. But Larry, what you're saying, I mean, it, it, no matter what professional or, or personal scenario you're talking about, it, it, it's right because you see, even you see young attorneys who go into court or they go into a deposition, they've got their hundred questions they want to ask right. and they just go down the line where it's, you know, okay, you got to get, I get it. You got to get to certain topics, but listen to what the person is saying because you want to follow up to what they're saying. And I think in an, exactly. in an office environment too, like a lot of times you're getting clues from your boss, you're getting clues from your client and, and you miss them. Mm-hmm. You miss right. Them. Absolutely. And so this is why, so, so I, I moderate a lot of panels and people ask me, right, to moderate a lot of panels and I, and I do it well because of the simple fact that I listen and I drive the panel based on responses to questions. So I'll set up maybe three to four questions for an hour panel. And people are always like, well, don't we need more questions? I'm like, no. I'm like, "That's this is all I need. Mm-hmm. These questions are just teasers to begin a conversation. And then based on responses to those questions, right, I then glean other questions that need to happen because I'm listening specifically to what you are saying. And that's then going to drive the other questions versus me just putting this scripted list of questions together. And you can tell when you listen to a moderated panel who has these scripted questions that they just got, you know, sort of labeled out and they're going to go through the one, two, three to 20 questions versus those panels where they are doing it based on the conversation. And I think it, it matters a ton. And, and, and again, I apply that holistically across everything I do. And you can tell, too, like if it's a panel, you know, where, you know, like if you see like there's a panel where sometimes you're arranged at a desk and everyone's got papers in front of them versus if it's a panel where it's like right. it looks like a living room. I'm always like the right. living room panel is the one I want to go to. Right. That's the one I want to go to because right. they're going to be just talking. It, three smart people talking about an issue with somebody who knows. Who they, well, all right. We have to take a short break. We're going to return now with Ernie's Lifestyle Polygraph, which is a series of scripted questions. But we're going to pivot and we're going to try to lighten it a little bit here. But Larry, thank you so much. Um, Everybody, please stay with us. You're listening to the No Password Required podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. This This is a good one. This is going to be, this is a challenging one. Who... 
is the coolest motorcycle riding character in movie or TV history? The coolest? The coolest. So the coolest has got to be Fonzie, right? I, I mean, uh, Fonzie, the nice. Fonz, the, the Fonz is right. The Fonz is the co- the coolest, right? Um, uh, the the other one that came to mind was Evil Knievel because I watched Evil Knievel a lot, right? And I loved Evil Knievel, like 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 I loved him. I had all the Evil Knievel toys. The, the one that you crank up and you pull yes, the you thing crank up, and, yeah, and, yeah, yes, yeah. and then it go in the ramp. I yes, absolutely, I loved Evil Knievel. But the coolest was the Fonz. The, the Fonz, huh? Leather jacket, hair never moved, white t-shirt. Like, the Fonz was the guy. Evil Knievel was, like, a level of danger that, like, even with the X Games and and, and, and all the stuff that's on TV now, man, that was raw in a way oh, yes. that it isn't today. Right, yeah. right. So he would have can... won America's Got Talent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, hands down. Yeah. Right. I mean, he wa- he is America's talent. I, that, right. I mean, that's why he wore the, the red, white, and blue yeah. thing. That's what it was. He was a, he is America's talent, or was. I yeah. guess he's uh, was. he's yeah. yeah he's he's ridden the motorcycle into the sky, um, but didn't he jump the Grand Canyon? Wasn't that one of his things? Yep. Yeah. Attempted to jump the Grand Canyon. I don't remember specifically if he made it. I think there was a, a component and he went down. Maybe he did jump the actual Grand Canyon. I do remember it. Yeah. I just don't remember how it was set up. It may have been a smaller gap of it. Right, but I mean, it's still it's the Grand Canyon. The right? Grand Canyon, so, man. Sure. I I confuse him a lot with the character on The Simpsons that's based on him, and so I <laughs> that's like my childhood is kind of it's all mixed up in there. All right, so here we go. Number two, what is one thing you wish you could do better? One thing you wish you could do better. <sighs> one thing I wish I could do better. So honestly, say no. There you I, go. I, I I have a problem saying no. My, my my girlfriend she she tells me all the time, and she 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 put this phrase in my head: "No is a full sentence." <laughs> right. And, <laughs> I like and, that. <laughs> because you know the, the reality is is I because I want to help people, I tend to overcommit myself. Right. I commend. I co- I tend to commit to too many things and stretch myself very thin for others. And I've had to learn over the last two or three years discernment and and only doing things right that are going to add value um, and not doing things for everybody and recognizing that, you know, my own sanity is just as important as helping other people. And so, right, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting. So if you, and I've gone through therapy for this, like just being fully transparent, I am, a, I am a proponent for therapy, personal therapy. I think everybody, right, like should, you know, try and do it just to figure out their own demons, right? But um, uh, going through it, I, I learned that self-care is the most important care that you have, right? And a lot of people don't focus enough on themselves. It's not to say be egotistical and, and you know, and mm-hmm. get self-centered. It's to recognize your weaknesses and flaws and recognize when you have reached your point instead of just giving of yourself, giving of yourself, giving of yourself because you, you feel that's what you're supposed to do. There's a point where you've got to take care of yourself, right? And whatever that is, whether it's eating, exercise, right? Mental health, right? Whatever that is, self-care is the most important care because at the end of the day, um, if you don't care for yourself, nobody else is going to care for you. Right. And that's in your personal relationships. That's in your professional relationships. If you aren't really taking care of yourself, if at work, people are coming to you with all their challenges and, and, and you're helping everybody else and you're not getting your own work done. Your boss isn't going to care yeah. because your boss is asking you to do specific yeah. things that they need from you. And if you say, well, hey, I, but I helped Jane and I helped John and I helped Jack and I helped. So all the stuff that they gave to you is because I helped them. Your boss is going to say, but I ask you yeah. to do these things. Right. And so self care, right, professionally and personally is the most important thing that anybody should should give some focus to. And so for me, um, I wish I could say no more. And I'm getting there to be very clear. I'm getting there. If you had met me, you know, three or four years ago, oh man, it was bad. Like I, I like it was it was bad. I never said no. I, I never said no. I would find a way to make anything happen for anybody else. I would find a way. 
right? Regardless of what it did to me, how much it stretched me, how much it, you know, pulled me in one direction or another, I would find a way. Is there a game show that you would love to compete on? Ooh, so that's an interesting one. Yeah. So, you know, um, um, so from a skills perspective, I'm going to give a couple of answers to this. So from a skills perspective, the one I would love to compete on is Wheel of Fortune. Okay. Wheel of right? Fortune, just, huh? Yes. Just because, you know, solving, I've watched people say some of those phrases and I've looked at that and I'm like, what <laughs> in the sand the hell? Are you <laughs> how do you get like, that from there? Like, you know. <laughs> like, seriously, how did you, right? How did you not know what that was, right? But the one that intrigued me the most that I just loved just because of how the game was, was um, Press Your Luck. Press. No whammies, no whammies, no, no whammies, whammies, no whammies. <laughs> right? <laughs> that whole concept of whammies just used to make me laugh so much and them dancing across the screen. and Right. I love that show so, so much. That was the show that, that I used to. Uh, years and years ago when that came out, I used to want to be on that show so, so bad. <laughs> Press your, now, I'm trying to remember. Now, did they, so you, you push the button and it, and it, it right. so went it around. Right, so it went around and, you, and you had to press it, press it so it would stop somewhere on yeah. a trip or money or something, right? And you couldn't get three whammies. You get three whammies and you were, and you're, yeah. right? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's what it was. Yeah, there wasn't like they didn't they didn't ask you any no questions skill. or anything. It was yeah, just push no, the button and no skill. <laughs> it was just literally all about timing and luck, right? But it was and you and you had the opportunity to say, okay, yeah, I'm done. I've got enough money. I don't want it, right? Because it was whoever had gotten the most money. No, the, at the, right? That's right. Without getting three one at the end, right? And you had to make that decision. So it was this. It was almost a gambling risk based decision, yeah. Right? That you had to. Oh, have I got enough money? Do I want to take a chance? Or do you want to press your luck? Hey. You want to press your luck, right? So that's I used right. to love it. I used to love it. Okay, here we go. Here's another one. Number four. Uh, how do you define success? Um, for me, success is happiness, right? So, so um, being happy with yourself, being happy with the life that you lead, being happy with the impact that you're having on those around you and society as a whole, right? If you as a person are comfortable with that, then I think you're being successful, right? I, I, you know, a lot of people define success monetarily. A lot of people define success, you know, um, with with you know things you have, right? That type of thing. For me, it is just being in a state of happiness with your life and in all in all aspects of how you measure it, right? And so for me, I look at it, you know, uh, spiritually, uh, physically, uh, emotionally, right? And and then you can add monetarily to it because to be clear. Right. Lack of money can bring stress. Right. If you're not able mm-hmm. to pay your bills and those types of things. So it's hard to be happy if you if you don't have the money to support your, your basic needs. Right. Um, but if you if you do, it's not about having abundance. It's just about are, are you able to support your, your basic yeah. needs and are you happy in, in those other aspects? And for me, that's that's success. That's success. And so, like, I I consider myself extremely blessed and extremely successful uh, because I've got five healthy children and technically seven because my girlfriend has two, right, who I I call them my daughters. um, And and they're all extremely doing extremely well in the different stages of life where they're at. And and we're just it's just great, you know, so mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally and and. economically i just feel i'm at the best place i've ever been in my life so yeah larry do you think about i mean you've had a lot of very like cool jobs and had a lot of responsibility uh in a variety of different places and now you're in a spot where you know professionally you're helping a lot of others you know and you're making an impact do you think about your legacy a lot like is that a daily thing or do you check in on it like what do you think about like what you've built and who you're helping yeah, so, so it's interesting you asked that question. So um, we, we sort of got into this conversation in, in the organization of trying to figure out, you know, when I'm gone, and not gone from the planet, but when I leave the organization in my role, right, as one of the co-founders, and we ha- have had a couple of co-founders that literally just transitioned off of our board, how do we honor what has been built, right, by those of us who, who, who helped build it? And, and I don't think about my legacy for me, 
Um, and, and I shouldn't say that. I do think about it a little bit, right? Every now and then it'll pop up. But for me, at the end of the day, it's not necessarily about legacy. It's about have I been a good steward? Like when I when I enter the gates of heaven, does God look at me and say, good job, right? Does he say, well done, my faithful servant, right? And, and for me, that's the important piece of, of do I want people here to remember that I did good and so forth? Yeah, but is is do I think everybody's going to? No. And and through discernment, I've had to realize that I can't please everybody because that's part of why I never said no, because I wanted to please everybody. I didn't want any, anybody to be upset with me, right? So I, I, I was always, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. But through discernment, I've, I've pissed some people off. But now I can shrug my shoulders and say, eh, right? <laughs> that's on them. That's not on me. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, so for me, yeah, I think about it a little bit, but for me, it's more so... Am I doing what God has intended me to do? If I if I if I can say yes that I'm still working down that path of what He has allowed me to find as my purpose, then I'm good. I like that concept of stewardship too. Is that we're taking care of something and then others will also help take care of it too, and and we can. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. All right, here we are. Fifth and final question: Literally or figuratively, professionally. Or personally, what's the best way to get your hands dirty? Ooh. So, um, for, for me, I am still a geek, right? And so I've still got, you know, VMs that run uh, on, you know, MacBooks and iMacs at home. You know, I still every now and then, you know, jump into, I don't nearly have the command line skills that I used to. But, you know, I still get in and mess around on occasion uh, inside my own home network, right, of messing with the kids' computers and doing things to them, right, just so that they understand and know that. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> that That's a risk out there, right? So, you know, one of my kids will be on their iMac, and, you know, I may take control of the mouse and start moving the mouse. And it's funny to watch a nine-year-old's reaction to their mouse moving and it's not them. <laughs> you know, turn around, look, Dad, Dad, what, what are you doing? doing? That's awesome. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, it's crazy. No. <laughs> yeah, no, it's <laughs> so it's, it's <laughs> funny. So I, I do some of those things, and you know, I do, uh, you know, uh, blocking on my network at home, right? Where the kids are subnetted off, and they're like, "Hey, I can't get to something." I'm like, hey, is your room clean? <laughs> nice. Well, uh, I don't, I don't know I don't what happened that. there. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, uh, that's the yeah, universe yeah. telling you you can't. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I bet when your room gets cleaned, then it'll work all of a sudden. Yeah, it's, it's amazing <laughs> these internet service providers how much data they have on you. They they can tell your room's not clean. It's so, crazy. So yeah. So for me, that that's the getting my hands dirty. I don't really. I don't t- technically, figuratively, or literally get my hands dirty. Uh, anymore, my, it was. It's my nails are a thing. <laughs> I'm a I'm a metrosexual at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it, it's dirty with electrons. You can't see them. Yes. You know that's right. It's, it's yeah. dig, digital dirt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, but I, but I do. I, and up beyond that, it's probably my motorcycle. I've got a I've got a nice Harley that I love very much, and it's my my sort of side hobby, my side passion that that I I love to get out. But it's interesting. The whole getting my hands dirty thing has become less and less of a thing uh, as, as my, my, my girlfriend is constantly says to me, she's like, babe, you should not be spending your, your brain power on, on medial task, right? Like, like farm it out. Like there are certain things that you just should not, if you, and she, she made me think about this because I was one who said, I was, I'm a man. I can do anything. Yeah. I can do that. I don't need to pay somebody to do that. I can, I'm a man. I can do it. I can, I can patch a hole in the wall. I can fix the yeah. toilet. I can replace the toilet. I can mow the yard. I can do it. And, and she sat me down. She's like, I want you to think about how many hours you spend doing these other things. Right. And then what would you, what, what's your bill rate? Right. If you're yeah. a consultant, what's your bill rate? Right. That, so, so would you pay somebody? I'm like, hell no, I wouldn't pay somebody that amount to do that. She says, well, that's what you're doing. Yeah. She says, so because there's something else that you could be doing that's more productive. And I was like, oh. And since then, <laughs> man, oh, man. Well, let me tell you, I will never cut a yard again. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, there's just certain things that I'm like, I'm out. I've washed my hands of ever doing it again just because once I realized the economical 
component of it, right? 70 bucks a month, what, 75 bucks a month for them to cut my yard once a week? Half, like, what, wait, what? And they do it in 15 minutes? I'm like, oh, what have I been doing all my life, yeah. right? And so there's these things that I've learned, right, just over time. And because, again, I've got this great partner on my side that that uh, me getting my hands dirty is far and few between at this point. Now, let me let me just pull on that thread a little bit. Could it be, Larry that you're just not good at mowing the lawn and she's like listen i gotta find a way to get to, we get some professional help in here the last time that guy tried to fix the toilet oh my god i was cleaning up it was all that so i mean is, is there so uh so funny you say that so here, here's a scenario that really happened so my two youngest eight and nine needed new dressers and so went on wayfair we looked and and i let them pick dressers and you know, if you've ever ordered anything from Wayfair, right, it's you build it. They ship it. You it's like it. Ikea. Basically, That's Ikea. right. Pack. Yeah. Comes right. a flat pack. Basically yeah. Ikea. Right, yes. So um, I put my son's dresser together. Bam. Boom. Move it into his room. All good. Put my daughter's dresser together. I used the wrong screws in an area. Like, oh, so I can't take those out. So I go to the, I go to the store to buy more of the right screws to go in this other area. Well, because I used the wrong screws in another area, like it just never works. Oh. My, needless to say, let me, let me, yeah. So the $400 <laughs> dresser that I end up spending a week on, and when I say a week, I'm talking about three hours a day for seven days trying to fix. I end up buying that dresser again. So now it's basically an $800 dresser. <laughs> And then hire someone and pay to someone put it right through Wayfair to put it together, which cost me a hundred bucks, right? <laughs> they put it together, so now it's a nine hundred dollar dresser. <laughs> so she ends up with a nine hundred dollar dresser and a right, right, and this scrap that <laughs> I basically then throw, put out on the on the side of the road to throw it to end up going in the trash. <laughs> so needless to that say, awesome. right? <laughs> needless to say, that was my final lesson in stick to what you do well. And then find experts to do that other stuff. <laughs> well, I yes. got to tell you, uh, Larry, this has been enlightening, and uh, and uh, also, thank you very much for uh, for joining us on the show today. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. So, listen, how uh, how can our listeners uh, connect with you? Uh, you know, connect, learn more about Cyversity and all the good stuff that you're doing. How can they connect with you? Yeah, so, so you can go to our website, of course, www.cyversity.org, right? And so if you're wondering how the name Cyversity came about, I say cybersecurity and diversity had a baby, and we created <laughs> Cyversity, right? <laughs> so that's how you can remember Cyversity, right? Um, the other thing, I would say LinkedIn, but I get probably, I was getting like 80 random LinkedIn requests a day, and so I had to put the email the little email blocker on so that you got to know my email address. But um, I would say follow me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, uh, follow me on Instagram, right? And I am very basic. I am very simple. I am Larry Whiteside Jr., <laughs> pretty much everything I do. Um, uh, and so it's easy to find me if you look me up on any of the platforms. Uh, Larry Whiteside Jr. is is one of the most unique names, as weird as it is, um, uh, that's out there. So. Um, I, I just, and I'm, I'm an open, as you can tell, I'm an open guy. I'm an open share. Uh, so just reach out. That's fantastic. We'll be sure to send people that way. Thank you again, uh, Larry, for joining us. Coming up next, it's Technologue with Pablo Torres, where they're going to break down the mysteries of the cloud. All good things must come to an end, but we're not there yet. Welcome to the Technologue with Pablo Torres. Welcome to Technologue. I'm your host, Pablo Torres. On today's segment, we're going to discuss the importance of storage, more specifically cloud storage. The cloud, as it is often referred to, is a service model in which data is transmitted and stored on remote storage systems, where it is maintained, managed, backed up, and made available to users over a network, typically the good old internet. Now that we have gotten that out of the way, there are three main storage options based on different access models that have come from this cloud evolution, public, private, and hybrid. Let's start off with public cloud storage. These are services that provide a multi-tenant storage environment that is most suited for unstructured data on a subscription basis. Data is stored in the service provider's data centers with storage data spread across multiple regions and continents. 
Then we have private cloud storage. This is an in-house storage resource deployed as a dedicated environment protected behind the firewall. Private clouds are appropriate for users who need customization and more control over their data or who have stringent data security over regulatory requirements. And then finally, a mix of both, um, I'll call it the best of both worlds, hybrid cloud storage. Uh, while it's a bit cumbersome and it definitely has some hurdles and loops to jump through as far as uh, managing and accessing and, and using that data, it's, it's a mix of private cloud storage and third party public cloud storage services with a layer of orchestration management to operationally integrate the two platforms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, Pablo, what's the, what do you think is like the greatest or the top of the benefits of cloud storage? My, my official answer, Jack, um, you know, it's all about the Benjamins. <laughs> cloud storage has radically driven down the per gigabyte cost of storage. However, it is important to note that cloud storage providers have added operating expenses that can make the technology considerably more expensive depending on how it's used. So from a C-suite bottom line perspective, um, if, if I can save myself a handful of Benjamins, uh, that, that's definitely one of the greatest benefits. All right, so like if a listener wanted to save these Benjamins, what are the, the three most important questions they should ask before making the decision? You know, and um, that that's that's awesome that, that you're asking this because it, it's something that I experience with clients when we have conversations and we're talking about uh, deploying uh, cloud storage solutions for their environment. So uh, I, I've come across uh, three questions that, that seem to be most prevalent when it, when it comes to this transition. Uh, the first one would be, what are your uptime statistics and what happens to my data in the event of a disaster? The second question, um, most, most common would be, what is implementation like? Uh, you know, we want to avoid any sort of bottlenecks and any sort of hardships to, to uh, successfully complete this migration. And uh, then the third one is how easy is it to integrate with other applications? All right. So um, we talked a little bit about the Benjamins being the primary benefit of this, but what are some of the other advantages and then maybe some of the disadvantages of, of using cloud storage? Yep. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start off with the three advantages. Pay as you go is a highly attractive uh, business model from, from a bottom line perspective. Uh, with a cloud storage service, customers only pay for the storage that they use. Uh, this is uh, eliminating the need for big capital expenses. While cloud storage costs are reoccurring rather than a one-time purchase, they are often so low that even an ongoing expense, um, even as an ongoing expense, they, they may still be less than the cost of maintaining an in-house system. Um, global availability is another advantage. Uh, cloud storage is typically available from any system, anywhere, at any time. Users do not have to worry about operating system capabilities or complex allocation processes. So that's great. The availability and uptime is there. And then, and then lastly, as a great uh, advantage, um, I, I would have to say the ease of use. Uh, cloud storage is easy to access and use, so developers, software testers, and business users can get up and running quickly without having to wait for IT to allocate and configure the storage resources. Uh, now on the, uh, let's say the disadvantages and as a security professional, I mean, this one hurts me to the core, um, because I, I'd like to think that we're living within a very secure world when it comes to the cyberspace, but, uh, this, this would be part of the disadvantages for cloud securities. Um, the concern is that once the data leaves a company's premises, it is no longer under their control. Um, and how that data is handled and stored becomes a question for, for both parties, for both the, the provider as well as the owner of that data. Uh, storing regulated data is also a concern. Service providers have tried to allay those fears by enhancing their security capabilities with data encryption, multi-factor authentication, data storage in multiple locations, and improved physical security. So at, at the very very forefront of the security component for cloud where we're doing our best to make sure that we can offer not only availability but also hardening factors to make it that much more difficult to, to access these cloud storage destinations um a disadvantage uh, the second disadvantage would would be performance degradation um, a company may run into performance issues if its in-house applications need to access the data it has stored in the cloud um, in those cases, it will likely require either moving the servers and applications into the same cloud or bringing the necessary data back in house, which, which could be uh, labor intensive and it could definitely incur additional costs that the company itself wasn't uh, expecting. So that, that definitely becomes a disadvantage. And um, in some cases, costs. 
Um, of course, uh, we're talking about operational businesses and uh, we want them to be as productive and, and cost efficient as possible. Um, if a company requires a lot of cloud storage capacity and frequently moves its data back and forth between on-premise systems and the cloud, the monthly cost can turn out to be high uh, compared to deploying this, uh, the same storage in-house and then going um, and then the ongoing cost could eventually surpass the cost of implementing and maintaining an on-premise system. Um, so, yeah, it, it can get costly, but it all really depends on how the company is using that data. I'd always heard like the maximum, I don't know if it was true, that um, for very small companies, it's probably not worth it. But as you like grow, usually, the, at least from a security perspective, the security from the cloud is, is typically better than what you're going to be able to do on your own until you get gigantic and then you might be better off taking it back in house again. Is that like, is that roughly true or is there, there is that not accurate? Um, I, I, I want to split that and, and just say 50, 50, cause you can flip yeah. a coin. Um, but, but more so I, I'd say that having the security uh, outsourced to a service provider uh, gives you more uh, control over, over the security components. And it also allows you to have uh, more visibility because of the additional eyes that are, are securing your cloud infrastructure. Um, so as, as those small businesses grow and, and look for opportunities to scale, uh, cloud is definitely going to be an advantage. Um, and then it also facilitates the whole remote uh, work from home culture because it allows for your organization to be spread out but still have a consolidated source of, uh, for your data repository. All right. That brings us to the end of the program. And thank you very much for joining us. First and foremost, I have to thank my co-hosts, Jack Clabby and Pablo Torres, and a very special thank you to our guest, Larry Whiteside, a Fonzie fan whose wit and intelligence will never, never jump the shark. So, ladies and gentlemen, remember to rate and review and subscribe to the No Password Required podcast. You can find us on social media at No Password Pod. Be sure to send those questions and comments to info at nopasswordpodcast.com. And if you'd like some show swag, just ask. We'll hook you up. As always, I'm Ernie Farresso, and thank you again for listening. We'll talk again soon. Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. A special thanks goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields and Second Watch. If you would like to learn more about the show, visit our website at cyberflorida.org slash pod. And if you still need more show content, check out our social media at No Password Pod.